I've been asked to share some of my experiences of fundraising, um, but also I think for us to listen to each other and to share some of our own experiences and think about how we might be able to uh, help each other and work together perhaps in the future. We'll come on and talk about uh, uh, twinning, twinning centres later. Um, I hope that it will be fun. Um, there's the old joke about putting fun into fundraising. Uh, there is a bit of a session at the end where I hope we'll all have a chance to, to join in and participate and share, and I hope that will be fun. Um, there's a lot to cover in fundraising, so we'll, we're going to talk about uh, guiding principles, um, buzzwords, terminology, but just to say it's very selective, this session. It's a very short session, and we're only just really touching upon some of the guiding principles. Um, I hope it will um, inspire further thinking, further research, um, and that we'll have future sessions as well where we go into some more detail if, if there's kind of requests for specific areas and specific support. So yeah, I hope we'll be sharing and supporting. Um, I'll spend, I think, about 15 minutes going through some of the guiding principles that, that I think are really interesting and, and helpful to me when I do my fundraising. Um, and then also some of the obvious pitfalls to avoid. So the things that you should try, you know, the kind of obvious mistakes that people surprisingly make quite often when they're writing to potential funders or, or trying to meet with potential funders. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes just on, a, on a, a handy short tool to summarize the previous session on uh, guiding principles. We'll then look a little bit at the two ways that you can communicate your work to ask for funds. Obviously, the one is that you will be doing written proposals or formal applications, and there's a set of principles there. And we'll also be looking at when you're, how to talk about your work and how to really inspire people to give money um, when you're speaking about your work in person or over the telephone, perhaps, or in these days um, through Zoom calls. Um, so that will be templates and elevator pitch. And then the, the heart of the session, I hope, will be uh, taking part and having a go at to um, talk. Um, it's an exercise really to, for you guys to have a go at talking about your work, uh, a role play, um, asking for money from, from um, a rich person, but we'll come on to that and talk more about that. Um, I'll briefly talk about sources and resources, although again, that will be, this is quite generic and that will be specific to your regions. Um, again, perhaps that's a future piece, piece of work in a, a future session. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, just I thought it'd be really helpful to me, um, perhaps to others as well. I know that you guys have all met each other before, but I'd be interested to just hear your name, um, your centre, and just one example of just to get an idea of what fundraising you're currently doing. Um, we've talked to here. I think there was an email um, before this session asking you to think about sharing one success story. You can share a success story, but also. Um, it's interesting sometimes to share a failure, to share something that doesn't work because that, you know, can help us to, you know, analyze that, think about what, what we could have done differently. Um, and I've put here, fundraisers much like rejection. It's one of the first things I learned when I started my career. I had to learn to love being told, no, you know, I will send out 20 applications to a trust, to, to a bunch of trusts. Um, 18 will ignore me. One person will send back a letter saying, thank you, but no. And maybe one will send a donation. So you really have to be resilient and learn to love, love rejection. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name's Paul, Paul Julian. I am a fundraiser. I've been a fundraiser for uh, 20 years, been with Penn International um, for about five months, trying to really develop their, their kind of wide fundraising um, because you know, they, they rely very much on, uh, on a Swedish funder, um, on our publisher circle, on the writer circle. All of these are struggling at the moment, partly because of COVID, partly for other reasons, the economic crisis. Um, so really trying to be creative and trying to find new, new sources of, of, of funding, new donors, new ways to engage people in the work of Penn across the world. Um, so that's my um, quite daunting task. Um, I was thinking about sharing a success story just to get people going. Um, but I, I was thinking it's, I'm not sure if it's a su success story or a failure story, so I'll, I'll share it with you and I'll let you decide. When I was first starting off in fundraising, I was asked to, uh, to a business breakfast to make a pitch uh, from a major donor through a trust. And so I put on my suit and tie and I was very nervous and it was very formal. We met in, a, in, a, in an expensive restaurant, cafe, uh, for breakfast. Um, and it was very stilted, it was very cold. We ordered coffee, we ordered food. Um, I ordered poached egg on a plate and I got my knife and fork as we were exchanging pleasantries and I cut into my egg and the egg yolk squirted all over my nice new suit. I, I was 
mortified and so nervous that I, I just couldn't believe it. And the person, the donor, just laughed. And that was the best thing that could have happened because suddenly it wasn't cold, it wasn't formal, uh, and a connection was made. We'll come on to some of these buzzwords later. The connection was made. It was about two human beings, two normal people, just sharing the same values, perhaps, sharing the same passion for the cause, just on two different flip sides of the coin. Um, and from then on, we built the relationship, still in touch with this person. This was about 15 years ago. And they went on to give, give various grants and donations to, to the charity that I was working for. Um, so that's my, that's my little anecdote. So I'm not sure if we have volunteers for, or shall I name people as we go around introducing? Okay, how about um, Folu? Apologies if I get people's names wrong. Folu, is that right? Yeah, you're right, yeah. Um, thank you, um, Folu from Nigeria. Yeah, um, well, we, we've done um, uh, some projects uh, for which we actually uh, uh, sought funding from various uh, people, but uh, the environment it happens that we, um, we were mistaken thinking that maybe uh, the government, uh, government functionaries could, could really come, come with, with donations to our, to our projects. But, but then, uh, so we had to, at the point, look inwards. And then uh, last year that we had to uh, do an anthology, we got um, some 450 uh, pounds from, from Penn International, but actually we needed more, a lot more than that. And so we had to really, when we couldn't get uh, funding from outside, we had to really look inwards and uh, raise the funds within the collective, within Penn Nigeria. And that's how we, we so fundraising is not really uh, that easy, especially around this environment where, uh, well, um, a lot of people are maybe Philistines. They, they, they really don't understand what um, we are really about. Talking about literature and, and stuff, and so, so not music or, or, or the theatre. So that's yeah. that's a little experience in Nigeria. But well, so you mentioned government funding. Perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, some of the opportunities yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and ways to get through to. Sometimes it's just about who you know. It's about you know people. Yeah. and making those connections okay um yeah yeah lamia would you like to go so hi everyone i'm uh, lamia i'm secretary general at pen bostia i hope you can hear me i'm not sure it, is it okay so um yeah uh well most of our success stories are um connected with uh international and foreign uh, <laughs> um fundraising and um we do have a problem in Bosnia, like the whole culture scene and cultural institutions. Our museum has bankrupt uh, oh. five years ago. And, uh, so it's pretty difficult. Um, also, two years ago, uh, the government has cut out our funds for like basic funds, um, like our bills and stuff. So we have to pay for everything through projects. So this is uh, a difficulty the, the project you are financing right now I had to include uh, I don't know some bills for the internet and so on and so on for, and for the account because I don't have I have to um, so list them in different projects with which I applied to because I don't have any other resources uh, for that and also um, what we do have here a problem uh, with government funding also. Uh, we applied this year with three projects. It was about 15,000 euros in, in total. It's not that, kind, that a big amount of money. And uh, they always give us the same amount, which was like less than a half for those three projects. And it's always the same amount. Whatever projects I apply with, they will give me the same sum. I, I just know that's true. So um, that is kind of like uh, a problem here. But also um, what's good is that uh, from the federal ministry this year, we did receive funds for a project that's um, about um, enforcing women writers and so on. So they do have these uh, quirks they have to fill out, I think. <laughs> so if they, if they have to support a pro-feminist project and so on. So we are sort of, being a bit smart, smarter that, uh, in thinking towards those kinds of projects. Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> a challenging environment, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> not a part of this presentation, but you did mention um, builds and overheads and those kind of costs that are part, not a part of project grants. I mean, it could almost be a separate session about presenting budgets to funders. I used to work in um, international aid and donors would say to me, I, we want our money to go to, to the food parcels, to the, to the actual beneficiaries. They didn't want to fund overheads, admin costs, admin. And I used to say to them, I learned to be very confident to say, what, what do you think admin is? It's all admin. Everything about getting that food parcel to that beneficiary in that country, you need laptops, you need people to unload from the trucks, you need the audit. You, nothing happens without you being able to pay the bill. So when there's ways that when you present those budgets, those are essential project costs. They shouldn't yeah. be dismissed as kind of separate admin. Nothing happens without admin. Anyway, that's a separate um, session, perhaps. Um, is it, sorry, Mohammed or Mohuddin? Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving the uh, chance to speak here. It's my pleasure. And uh, I would like to thank everybody, all the countries from uh, pen centers uh, from Pen Bangladesh. Okay, I'm the Secretary General from Pen Bangladesh. Uh, for fundraising, actually, uh, you know, we have uh, more than 130 members uh, in 130 pen members here in Bangladesh. Most of the uh, members are teachers, uh, writers, uh, journalists, and uh, bloggers also here. Uh, but they are doing their respective jobs and we are just uh, 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 we have yearly subscription uh, in our uh, uh, centers but it's you know it's difficult uh, to collect the subscription because most of the uh, PFP members uh, uh, we need to talk too much to them and we request them but it, it's difficult to collect actually it's we cannot collect the uh, annual, uh, it's about only uh, $20 yearly. Okay, it's difficult to collect and uh, most of the members don't like to pay it regularly. And it's happening here, but uh, we uh, are doing some pro uh, programs here, the national programs, international writers in prison day, uh, World Women's Day and many programs, just collecting uh, funds from members, uh, okay. We don't have any other source or uh, any other uh, fund from here. This is the first time we got uh, a Pan International Fund for civil society project. This is the first time and we have started our webinars and digital programs, our dialogues and many pro programs on freedom of expression here. This time, just uh, uh, this month, okay. we started it. And actually, uh, we need more uh, counseling about the how we can uh, raise funds for our many programs and collect programs and uh, do the programs. Okay, uh, thank yes, you. I guess you won't think of it this way because you're clearly struggling and relying on those subscriptions. But I'd see that as quite an exciting time to be at because the whole world there, you haven't tried, you haven't gone to your local community, local businesses. I mean, you never know what's going to be out there once you start. And I realize that you're volunteers and it's about finding. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think there is this cause for hope there in that you haven't, you know, you haven't gone out there before. Okay, thank you, Ma. Thank you. Um, Abdullahi, would you like to go next? Yeah, good morning to everybody. I'm very glad to be with you again. Um, my name is Abdullah Sila, Pen Guinea Bissau. Um, we are newly admitted last year, I guess. Um, I'm here basically to learn from you. Why? Because um, I come from the, um, I mean, I'm a writer and um, fundraising is not part of the game especially in our environment. A writer have to keep some, some distance from the um, either the government or, you know, any other um, sorts of, 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 of funding. So basically I have no experience to share with you. I um, personally have uh, never done it. So, I'm basically here to learn again. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's interesting you said fundraising as a route of fundraising is not a part of the game, which is a really interesting phrase. And I think I'd say fundraising isn't rocket science. And we probably, some of the principles, some of the techniques we'll talk about um, are all transferable from our personal lives. So I'll talk about, we have these mixed meta metaphors of relationships and dating, the way we interact with people, the way we live our lives, organize our lives. And if we're gardeners or agriculturalists, also the, some of the techniques we use there can be applied to how we develop relationships, how we build up to going to someone and asking them to invest in our work. So um, don't be scared, it's gonna be fun. And again, you have a journey ahead, which I'm a little envious of. It's untapped, for me, I see it as an untapped field. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going through the screen. Ketley, would you like to go next? Hello, yes, thank you. Good morning, all. I am Ketley Mars from Penn Haiti. Uh, I have been president of the Penn Haiti for almost three years now, and our Penn was founded uh, back in 2008. Uh, when I uh, was elected president to about three years ago, uh, our pen was going through a crash. As it happens to several pen, I understand we go through the waves, sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, depending on who's leading, who left the country, who has difficulties doing it, who lost interest. There are so many reasons why our pen centers go through rough times at times. So the first thing I decided to do was to, to make a fundraiser to collect funds to pay for uh, late bills of rents for electricities and uh, human resources that was long overdue. And it was a very uh, traumatic experience for me that's fundraising because by nature, I'm not uh, disposed to ask money, although I'm doing it for an institution, but it's not part of myself. So uh, what we uh, tried to do was to uh, have a big uh, soiree, artistic uh, soiree where an artist would come and give a, a, a show for us and people would buy ticket and come and uh, that would be it. So we had uh, that part of the fundraiser. And also I wrote so many letters as you were mentioning earlier to banks, uh, organizations and asking them to, to help us. Uh, put uh, the the pen the pen Haiti back on feet. So uh, as far as the 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 the, the soirée the the big bash was concerned, it was not a big success. It was a success uh, formally, but as far as uh, getting funds from uh, selling tickets, it was not a success. But I had uh, I received uh, some funds from a couple of banks in Haiti and one other institution that uh, really help us uh, well clean our our debts and start a new a new period for our our pen Haiti and since then I have to say that we've been a, a little bit successful in receiving funds for some projects but again the big problem is the overheads as you were saying the re human resources and the uh, we cannot rely uh, on the, the, the members' uh, participation each year, which is very low, a low amount. So most of them are students, are uh, young people who have no, no finance. And uh, so this is difficult. When you present a project, they tell you, OK, we are financing just the project, as if there is, is some extraterrestrial that is going to take care of uh, all the, the, the work. So uh, I'd like to learn a little bit from your experience, each one of you, and also what is the, 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 the smarter way, the, the, the most effective way to present my organization and uh, have people be interesting in helping us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that you found it traumatizing um, and that it's hard to ask for money. I love asking rich people for money because for me, it's not about private gain. It's about they believe in a cause, they have a connection, there's a reason why they've, they've, they're interested in that work of the charity. And I'm just there as a bridge to facilitate, to join the money with, to the people who need it, to the work that needs to be done. Um, but we'll talk more about that. It sounds like, I mean, you have this donation from this bank and another institution you mentioned. Um, I really hope that for me, I would go to my friends before I go to new people. You know, I would try to really work on that relationship, ask for introductions, think about could they, uh, help you maybe with peer-to-peer -peer us 
to ask another institution and to match their giving, to join them in supporting. People love doing that. People love to be doing it as a group. Um, but yeah, we hope, yeah, hope we can help. Okay. Um, Jorn, would you like to say a few words? Hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm Yon from uh, Penn, Cambodia. So, Penn, Cambodia, a little bit quiet. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, like, we, we got like a, a big pressure for civil rights society. So, the freedom of expression is so small. So for our activity also <laughs> a bit quiet, like a big storm and then try to be stay safe because uh, we don't have a big uh, event for a racing fund. <laughs> we don't have like uh, before, uh, before 19, or tw sorry, uh, 2016, yeah. So like a big uh, destroy for, for the freedom of expression. So many civil organizations have been moved out of the country. So we, we try to do something very quiet. We don't have uh, any resources to uh, promote our program, to produce our program, because our previous president, Hank String, has escaped Cambodia to US <laughs> because yeah, I think for his personal uh, safety, because he did not work only for Pen Cambodia, but he worked also for uh, NGO that uh, work with uh, protect the people for freedom of expression. So many, many of uh, people who work for freedom of expression have been flee out of the country uh, from 2017 until now. So. Today, yeah, I work for Pen Comedy or uh, one year already, but our uh, activity or any uh, program for raising money, we have never done it. Yeah, and we, we get some fun from Pen uh, International, and we, we are planning to produce uh, a program called uh, a Writer TV. Yeah that I hope will be uh, released some video that we interview about the documentary about of writers. So, yeah, <laughs> what we, the, the, the financial support mostly uh, we got from uh, Penn International. Yeah. We don't have uh, any donor in Cambodia for supporting our activities so far. Okay. Um so perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about the, the limits of the support of Penn International for so many centres and the way that we need to develop local fundraising, I think, just to make sure we can all yeah, develop sure. and grow our projects. You mentioned that you can't do anything public, um, too much publicly, so we need, need to maybe talk a little bit about private conversations appro approaching private individuals. Um, I'm curious about the former president in the state. Is he, are you still in touch with with him or her, I mean, because that could yeah, be. Uh, yeah, yeah, he 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 now is in US. He's safe. Yeah, <laughs> he moved out. So yeah, we we still yeah. yeah. Because honestly, I'd, maybe he could help there. There were lots of people who who want to help. I know America has a very bad reputation, um, especially yeah, at the moment. Yeah. But actually, it is a, a country which has um, a culture of giving, of charitable giving. Um, so perhaps that's a that's something we can look at as well. Okay. Thank you, Yon. Um, I mean, the other thing that we might talk a little bit about, it, maybe in a future session where we hope to have um, presentations from some of the more successful centers that have done fundraising, like Swedish Pen, English Pen, and so on. Um, but maybe we should start thinking about twinning. I think this is possibly a model that could be successful for centers that are struggling to fundraise to partner with um, centers who have had more success and to kind of su su support one another. Um, but perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, who have I missed now? Um, Wesi, is that right? Is he Sukwa Panye? I'm sorry for saying the name wrong. No. Ah, Pat Patricia, I think this is. Hello. Right. Yeah. 
Hi, Sorry, Patricia. Mark, we can see you, but did I click? this is Wazy. Ah, oh, Wazy. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, my network keeps going on and off, on and off. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, from Penn Malawi, we haven't been able to do much of fundraising except for maybe last year, 2019, when we sourced some funds and managed to come up with an anthology, a Penn Malawi anthology, um, which was purpose to, to bring in more funds because we we're going to put it on the market so that it, it, it gives us um, income for the, for the center. Of course, we haven't been very successful because as it is, Malawi is not so much of a book market, but here and there, well, we're managing, yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't know much about Malawi, but I do, I do have a couple of CDs of Malawi music and I know there's a thriving music scene. I do wonder, mm -hmm. some, some of the writers on our case list are, are songwriters and musicians that we also work to support. I wonder if one idea, um, maybe link to the book, to the anthology and doing some kind of launch, which if you have a musical event, so then you're bringing in a new audience, people there to, to listen to the band, listen to the music, but are there mm -hmm. uh, exposed to the need of the center, um, donating to buy, perhaps not buy the anthology, but to make a donation uh, to take the anthology, which which might um, get more revenue, uh, but just, just an idea off the top of my head. Um, yeah, yeah, um, actually, actually we, we, we managed, we managed to launch it. We 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 launched it in the two cities um, where we are and in the central region. The one that we the, the first one was so much of a success. We got some funds of which we 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 used for other activities for the for the center. But since then, there hasn't been anything uh, going on. So maybe what you're saying. Uh, we'll buy into that idea. Yeah. yeah I mean, at the moment, that. having real musical events is obviously very challenging. Um, mm. You need to be mm. certain distance and you don't get the numbers of people. Um, I know that we're trying to support centres much more digitally and giving kind of um, resource and infrastructure to be able to do online events. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that's going to go, but you, you see on TV that um, the people with the money and, and the more famous people are managing to have quite successful concerts um, yeah. through the internet, but I think that's would need a lot of thought. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Wizzy. Um, Patricia, mm -hmm. sorry. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Patricia, uh, myself, and Wizzy, we come from the same center, which is Penn Malawi. So, Wizzy has highlighted uh, the most recent event which we had. And uh, its main purpose was really to fundraise. Uh, the other side of fundraising was that uh, we tried to have uh, annual subscriptions of members, but that one also did not work out very well for us. Um, so basically, we are here to learn, to learn from the centers that have uh, tried different fundraising activities and how it helped to boost their financial base. Otherwise, Penn Malawi very much uh, relies on funding from uh, Penn International. Uh, our own activities that we have tried uh, have not really uh, turned out very well. Like Wesley said, uh, last time we managed to get funding for the publication of an anthology and we managed to publish it and then uh, there was a function where we had to launch it. And we hope that uh, some of the members that will come to participate or to patronize the function would actually buy some of the books. And that would have been another source of income for Penn Malawi. Yeah. But then uh, some people took books and they promised to pay afterwards. We waited and we waited. <laughs> I think uh, basically we are here to learn from the centers that have been very successful in right. uh, fundraising for their centers. Right, okay. Um, yeah. Did you try to, I don't know what the uh, age group the anthology was aimed at, but I wonder whether going to schools and colleges and libraries might have um, generated some interest as well and got some income? Uh, well, the audience was uh, basically for adults and also college-going students. 
Right. But then considering the economy of Malawi and the number of people who actually value buying a book, uh, we always have a particular target group. Mm. So we know who to invite when we have uh, uh, such literal functions. So we hope from uh, the people that we invited, you know, to patronize the launch of the book. Uh, but then we haven't been very successful to partner with uh, the National Library only when it comes to sourcing uh, for some books uh, to donate to some, uh, uh, some of our branches in the country. That's when we have been able to get some resources from our partners, mm. like National Library. We have worked with the uh, Ministry of Education so that we can involve students in some literature yeah. activities. But financially, we haven't been very much successful locally. Okay. Um, yes, actually, uh, we are we are looked at as the the we we are looked at as the funders. You know, the ones that can donate. Literal, literal materials, but raising money, uh, we haven't really been that successful. Right. right. Um, I do know cases in the past where a, a book or a film has been launched and it hasn't been very successful. So you can actually do a different launch. Um, you know, you take your lessons. Um, and I'm thinking now with, with more events online, whether you could have I don't know, maybe it's too late, but maybe you could, man, cause it's, it's quite cheap to do this, to arrange an online event. It would be a reading from some of the writers, um, but the guests would have to, to pay to come and listen, listen to this session rather than mm. buying a book. They would listen to the writers reading out their pieces. The, the benefit of that is that you're not limited to the people who could come because they're close to the venue. You could advertise that everywhere, really, if you think about it. The yeah. whole world, you have the but then the our... <laughs> Our internet is uh, not that cheap to everyone. Yeah. It's unlike in the UK, the US, uh, this is one of the underdeveloped countries in the world. We are actually at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. So not very, not many people are actually involved in uh, online activities, you know? Right. Wow. Uh, so that is uh, one challenge that we have. We yeah. very much are involved in activities where people have to come. People have to come and then they interact physically. But uh, online activities, they are still limited to okay. um, corporate organizations, you know, uh, even in secondary schools. Uh, not many secondary schools in Malawi at the moment can access internet. Uh, at the university, they they subsidize the rate for accessing internet. So maybe a few university students, and they they mostly use it for research, for schoolwork, yeah. but not just for social activities. Uh, our economy is is not yet there. Yeah, I think yeah. there's discussion here to, to how we can help centers and to have better internet facilities. But of course, that's not going to help the people who we would want to come and log into these events. So, yeah, that's really challenging. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Um, I'm Moe. Would you like to say a few words about Pen Myanmar? I think you're there. Emo. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Good. Yes, hi. <laughs> Sorry, the, the phone was me. So yeah, hi, I am uh, Imo from Myanmar. So we say that in, in fundraising, Myanmar has been very lucky and very, uh, uh, it's great in, in, in terms of the fund for the fund because, uh, because we will be able to work with mainly work government, union parliaments. And in terms of that, the libraries, and mostly with government works, we will be able to get enough funds to do the trainings, to do the discussion, to do the uh, curriculum that we are uh, doing right now. So yeah, the main uh, conflict uh, we will be having that, like, like she said, phone bills and not being able to get in touch with uh, technology, enough technology uh, circulated here, uh, not having enough experience with 
that that's why online events because we because of the pandemic we have been shifted to online which is a difficult and conflict to uh do the sections and which can be uh, which is in fact uh, affecting our fundraising activities okay okay thank you um i think thank lastly you. ralph i'm just aware of the time we're about double time but that's fine ralph would you like i know we've yeah. heard from Penn nigeria but ralph would you like to say anything Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. Paul, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Ralph Tafegada from Penn, Nigeria. Actually, Folu has um, spoken about our experiences in fundraising here. Um, the little uh, history of uh, Nigeria with uh, literature is that um, in the second half of the 19th century, I think it was literature that actually launched Nigeria into the world map. Um, in less than a decade or two before then, we began to lose it. Uh, right now, we operate in um, uh, what I may refer to as a Philistine um, climate where a lot of educated people, in quote, have little or no interest in literature. So getting funding, even from some of your closest um, uh, friends who are financial. So it has not been easy getting funding here, except uh, the few funding we get, um, the little funding we get from Penn International. But we are not giving up on that. We still believe that um, uh, um, with time, probably we'll be able to get funding even from uh, some of our rich friends. But getting funding from the government is like um, uh, uh, getting a water out of a, a rock. Yeah. But we are not giving up on that. Uh, good to hear. You keep freezing. Um, yes. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I, I mean, okay. yeah, okay. okay. I was going to say something, my mind has gone blank um, about continuing to ask people for money. Yeah, you mentioned uh, literature is what you're asking people to invest in. And I, I don't know if this is relevant, but sometimes it's not, a, it's not about the actual project or the work. People want to... In, sorry, you're still talking, Ralph. I can see your... Okay. Sorry, we can't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Not really. Hello? Okay. Um, can you hear me now? A little. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you a little. Mm, I don't know. I think... Okay. Okay. Is it clear now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. The, you said something about uh, lit that is not all about literature. Yeah. I was thinking about pe people yeah. sometimes okay. want to give to values and ideals, and it's about you know principles and beliefs, not necessarily about literature, um, especially with individuals. So it's the way we talk about the work and the kind of events. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, are they, is it about literacy? Is it about inclusivity um, in the community for young people, for instance? So I think it's not just, you know, we're not asking people to buy yeah. literature. And I'm sorry, Ralph. Yeah. I'm going to raise of, um, uh, Ralph, could you use the chat? Could you? Oh, I think. Could you type in the chat? And then perhaps Anne can maybe tell us what you say. Okay, I'm going to, I'll come back to you, Ralph, if you have anything you want to put in the chat, but I'm going to move on just because I'm very conscious of time. Um, Maria, could we have uh, guiding, we'll start on guiding principles, back to the presentation. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, 
I'm going to go quite fast through this um, because we've all had a chance to speak and we're about 45 minutes in and we were supposed to be 15 minutes in, but it was really nice to hear of his uh, positions. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the... Very, yeah, it's very important or something. We're going to talk about some of the... Um, if everybody could mute who, who isn't talking, please. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the buzzwords that you hear uh, when you launch into the, uh, the arena of fundraising. There are hundreds of them, but I thought I'd just pick a few out, which uh, I find very useful. Um, I just wonder if, if anybody wants to come in and just pick one of those, uh, maybe stewardship, maybe cultivation, uh, and I have a go at saying what they think that means in the context of fundraising. Any volunteers? It's fine if, if people don't want to talk, but I'll, I'll wait a few seconds to give people a chance. Um, if anybody's talking, I can't see, but just remember to unmute yourselves just in case anybody is speaking. Oh, I, uh, I don't understand. I don't know the, the concept behind relationship fund, fundraising versus okay. transactional. Okay, I'll come on to that. Thank uh, you. Transparency is when you having that fundraiser and that afterwards you make public like the fund you receive, the expenses that, that were made and the, 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 what you have left in, in store to do your, your project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll move on. Um, next slide, please, Maria. So I'll answer your question first about relationship fundraising versus transactional. I don't do transactional fundraising. I think it's very bad. I do do relationship fundraising. Transactional is when it's something like just giving a very quick gift online without any engagement in the cause, without any conversation. Uh, you know, somebody might stop you in the street, you feel guilty, you just want to get rid of someone, you say, okay, here's, here's a dollar, here's a cent. Um, that's transactional. That's not um, how I found success and pleasure in fundraising. And I don't think it's really um, useful at all for Penn International or for the centers to, to, to try transactional fundraising. Um, I would be much more um, optimistic about long-term support for the work, thinking about relationship fundraising now, the word relationship, of course, has got a personal connotation. We all have our personal relationships. Um, I've always loved mixed metaphors. So throughout this presentation, right until the end, I think we'll hear uh, mixed metaphors from me about um, how the way we approach a relationship is actually useful, a useful way of thinking of how we approach funders and potential donors. The two metaphors are courtship, because actually um, talking to a company, um, approaching a trust or foundation, going to... Um, a wealthy person is a little bit like a courtship. Um, another analogy is that it's a little bit like agriculture or gardening, and I'll come on to that. Some of the some of the phrases that we hear in fundraising are taken from cultivation. Um, I'll give two quick examples. So, for instance, when we're doing uh, prospecting to find a, a new pool of major donors, we talk about seedlings. Our seedlings are a group of people who we hope will grow and bloom and be able to support us with major donations in the future. So we. We sow our seeds, our little seedlings, and of course you can't just leave them because they're not going to grow. They need water, they need sunlight, they need a little bit of love and care. That's the way that I deal with major donors, if I'm honest. Um, you have to look after them. You send them little messages, you find out about them. You, you send them updates, reports, maybe there's a press release, something in the news. If this is all before you've asked them for money. It's, not, it's, it's about um, building trust, building that connection, building that relationship with somebody who's got the capacity, who's got the wealth to help, but hasn't at the moment got the, uh, the motivation, hasn't got that understanding or trust in the charity. The same as you would find in a relationship and, and a little bit the same as you would find if you're trying to get a plant or flower to grow too soon. It's not going to grow, it's gonna wither and die. You need to look after it over a long period. There's also the concept of leaving a field fallow. With funders, um, you can't keep going back and every contact with, you have with them, you're asking for money. Some of those contacts have to be just to say thank you, just to say hello, just to update 
on a little bit of something that's happened with your work or one of the challenges you're facing. Um, in agriculture, of course, you would have this concept of, of, of leaving a field fallow. You would um, hit the field in the first year, the second year, you would hope to have a harvest, but you need to leave the field. This is the, the philosophy, is you leave one of those fields fallow for one year. You do not um, try to harvest from that field. You give it a year and then you go back the year after and farm it again. And that's the same with major donors, especially and sometimes with trusts and companies. You give them a gap so that, that they know that you care about the longer term relationship um, and that they're involved and invested in the charity and in the work, not just going to them for money every time you, you, you speak to them. Um, in a relationship, of course, in, in, in the UK, we talk about don't kiss on the first date. Um, you shouldn't, you know, you meet a rich person, maybe you shouldn't ask them for money straight away. Maybe you should ask for a meeting, maybe you should invite them to an event. You're going to scare them away if you ask too soon, too high. Um, it's about building trust. Um, this is the idea that people give to people. Um, one of the centres earlier mentioned um, money from government. And of course, that can seem a little bit cold and bureaucratic and the same with trusts and companies. But it's an old cliche that which I found to be true that people give to people. It's about building that connection, building the trust and the relationship. You're, you're not a charity, you're an individual. The person who's answering your call or answering your email in that government department is an individual with a heart, with feelings. It's all about the heart. Um, so we're looking about long-term sustainability, not just maybe not just trying to get a grant for the event or for this particular project. We're thinking about someone investing in the ideals of the work over a longer period, not a one night stand. Um, you can see there I've talked about low ball gifts. Uh, this is just an in interesting um, series of anecdotes of something I found um, in my fundraising career. I heard very early on about something called low ball gifts, um, which you have to be wary of. This is when you meet someone and before you've even asked, before you've even started really that deeper conversation, they're writing a check to you. They're getting out their wallet and they're trying to give you a, a dollar or $10 or $1,000. But actually, you know from your research, you know from your knowledge, that this is a person who could give $10,000. And you have to be very brave to do this, and I have done this. You know, the low ball is, is also called the fuck-off gift, the go-away gift. Once somebody has made you a donation, it's very, very difficult to go back to them to ask again. You have to wait a long time. You don't want someone to, you know, to give you a very easy transactional gift of a dollar when you know that if they get to know the work and get to know you and trust you and you have a relationship, you can ask them for a much bigger amount of money. Um, transparency, yes, that's, that's right, that it's about how we report back afterwards and how we spend. But I would say, as with relationships, that it's also about being honest with ourselves, honest about what are we delivering? What, what can we realistically achieve with the work? Um, and then obviously being honest with others about the work. But let's, there's no need to hide anything about what we're doing in terms of hiding the admin costs. We should speak loud about this work can only happen with those overheads, with paying the bills, paying the electricity. Um, so let's be honest with ourselves and others about what is achievable, what are those deliverables? Uh, and, and that ties in, of course, with the accountability that um, all donor projects uh, have to deal with these days and, and quite correctly too. Um, we hear about connection. And for me, that's about, again, it's about people talking to people. Um, Trusts and foundations are not faceless institutions. There's somebody working in there who's got a family, who's got a life, who's got a story to tell, um, and you want to connect with them. I've, I've worked on the other side as a grants giver, receiving applications for funding, and there was something called, I, I would call it bullet point hell. We received um, papers, applications that were just a series of bullet points um, or a series of statistics. Now, of course, we want to demonstrate uh, and show that we've got um, some science behind what we're doing. But people just close off. You see one statistic. Also, statistics can be massaged. You know, anybody who's savvy knows that you can be very selective about the statistics you choose. Much, much better. Don't, talk, don't put things into bullet points. Don't talk about statistics. Tell a story. Rather than try and talk about the whole project and the whole work, um, just tell one story of one individual who came to that session or one challenge um, and how that project made a change for that person. It's about um, tapping into the natural empathy that we all feel. As I've said here, um, I can't see all of my slides because of the, the pictures, but it's even in a bureaucratic application form, it's a, it's a human being reading it. Um, 
And for me, fundraising has always been about connecting with others who share values or aspirations, but are just richer than me. When I meet with really wealthy, I'm, I'm not wealthy, I'm quite poor actually, relatively. But when I meet with wealthy individuals, I don't feel intimidated because I know that we will share the same politics or the same values or the same concern about the cause that I'm trying to fundraise for. Um, next slide, please, Maru. Some more buzzwords. Uh, investment, again, I find a really interesting one in one because, you know, in the in the common understanding, we talk about financial investment, of course, it's, it's a banking term. Um, you have investment bankers. For me, I mean, obviously, I'm going to contradict myself here because I'm also going to say that no, nothing matters except for the money. Nothing happens without money. And people shouldn't be ashamed of asking for money because it's all about the work and making it happen. Um, but for me, really, that would be transactional, just thinking about the money that a person can give. For me, I understand that when somebody gives a large donation to a charity, to a project, it's an emotional investment. Often they have a connection, something has happened to them. Um, you know, in the case of literacy, perhaps somebody in their family is illiterate and it's been really challenging and there's a project that, that inspires them and is, is helpful to them personally. Perhaps reading has, uh, has transported them to, um, into a world of optimism and, and you know, a new world away from the struggles of their childhood. So you, it's about making uh, that connection and often, it, let's not forget, it's an emotional investment. Um, I see it as kind of a little bit um, binary, but it's a little bit, you'll see charities worldwide will go one way or the other. They'll either, they'll either focus on a positive way about talking about the work or the negative, but both of those about tapping into people's emotions, talking to a human being. Uh, the negative, you'll see the bigger agencies, you know, Oxfam, Amnesty, um, are, are started to do this less and less, but you'll hear the narrative, they talk about victims a lot. They talk about suffering and they want to show the suffering because that's going to, um, tap into a person's anger and the negative emotions. But actually you will also see charities, and this is um, my preferred style, who talk about the difference that the work has made, a positive approach, you know, um, being inspired by the work that's been, been witnessed. I say it's, it's a delicate balancing act, that's true. Um, and you have to somehow tell both sides of the story. You have to talk about, look, this is the challenge. This is why we're doing the work. This is why it's necessary. But it's also making a difference. There's positive change that comes from the work uh, that, that people are doing. Um, positive transformation and social change. Um, there's also the concept of time investment. Of course, when somebody's making a donation, uh, it's not just about writing a check um, or going through their emotions about the cause. They're doing their research. They're thinking about you know, the organization. Um, um, but also here, a nice, a neat time to, 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 to remind you that we're not talking about gifts of cash. Um, I think listening to you guys about your challenges and the work you do, maybe we all need to think about going to people for gifts of time and i.e. volunteering, people helping out um, and gifts in kind, maybe donating venues for events, maybe even supporting your um, the technical side. We talked about struggles of getting online. Maybe there's a way of thinking how a company could help facilitate an event um, on the kind of online side. Not sure, but let's think about gifts in kind. Um, another two buzzwords we hear all the time, we hear about stewardship in fundraising, we hear about cultivation. Cultivation, I say, is, is an obvious uh, um, metaphor there coming from gardening or from um, horticulture, agriculture. Um, stewardship is, well, I, I mean, I'll come on to this, but I'll hint here that it, for me, it's about saying thank you. It's about looking after the gift. It's about spending it well and, and reporting back on how that money has been used to make a change to someone's life. Um, that doesn't have to be a formal report. That can be a little email. Um, a lot of my work now is in WhatsApp messages. It's a strange world, but I, I find myself on WhatsApp with, with, with donors quite often. Um, <laughs> cultivation. Um, I've talked about seedlings that um, you have to spread your bets, actually. Here's another mixed metaphor, bringing in gambling. Um, don't just go to one person go to 10 people and you know that maybe nine of those won't, won't bloom, won't have a positive result for you, but one of them, all being well, would have. Uh, we hear about network mapping, and I think that could also be um, an interesting thing for centers to consider. It's about asking around, it's about doing a little bit of research on who would know who, um, and trying to reach new supporters. That can be companies, that can be businesses, um, we hear something as a part of this called CNLs, uh, a contact needed list. 
the mistake that you can make is if you go to someone who's a business leader and say, who do you know? Their mind will go blank. They won't be able to really know who, who they know, who would be able to help you. Much better is to go to them with a short list of names and say, do you know this person? Could you make an introduction to this person? Do you know someone who might know that person? It's about following those paths, trying to reach new contacts. Um, next slide, please, Maria. Um, a question that I hope we'll have a volunteer answer for. Uh, what is the main reason why people don't donate? Any volunteers? I might start naming and shaming people if people don't volunteer. <laughs> Any ideas? Can I answer? Yeah, I think. Is someone speaking? It's me, Paul Shawa. I think one of the reasons that I don't donate to, uh, if, it's, if, if I don't understand the cause, what exactly am I donating to? Yeah. Okay. So they don't understand. Is that about communication, clarity of communication? Anyone else? Patricia oh. wanted to speak, Paul. Who, sorry? Patricia. Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, and sometimes people don't donate because they just don't trust you. <laughs> they don't trust that what you are going to use uh, the money for what you're saying. So if some people don't trust you, they don't donate. And I also wanted to add that sometimes people don't donate uh, because they don't share your cause or they are not passionate about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, again, that's about building that trust and, and waiting until you feel the relationship is stronger to, to ask for help. And maybe asking for help in ways that aren't about cash gifts, about donations in kind. Um, okay, anyone else? I think that gets us going. I think, yes. Definitely. No, I, think that, I think people should uh, make it clear the story <coughs> or how to do, uh, why she, he or she should donate here. Say again, sorry? Who's speaking, sorry? Yeah. yeah. Mohit in Pen, Bangladesh. Ah. Okay. Uh, I, I think people should uh, make him understand about why he would like to donate here. It should be clear this story. Yeah. 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 Very good. You are all right. Um, next slide, please. But the answer I was thinking about the number one reason why people don't donate. Uh, next slide, Maria. Is that they weren't asked. If you don't ask, you don't get. Now, somebody mentioned at the beginning that they didn't like fundraising and that they were, I think they said they were traumatized. Now, I've heard people say they're nervous about asking for money. I've never heard anyone say they're traumatized before, which I'm really worried about. But um, there we are. And what I would say is, don't be shy. There's no shame in asking for support. Um, we're not doing this for private game. I, I, for private game, sorry. We're doing this for a good cause that we all believe in. Um, it's amazed me. I've worked over the years with, with leaders of charities, with chief executives, with executive directors, um, program directors, who have honestly felt afraid and ashamed of asking a rich person for money. Um, there's an idea that fundraising is a dirty word. It isn't. It shouldn't be separate it should be, to everything that we do or an add-on. It should be integral. It should be integrated, if possible, in all that we do. If we're, for instance, posting a social media video um, where there's a success story, where we're really concerned about a case, of course, we're trying to raise awareness. We're trying to be, uh, to activate people's responses uh, and to make social change. But we're also, you know, we, that doesn't happen without money. Um, so we also need to be asked, giving people the opportunity to support that work. People will see something that affects them, that will upset them, and they want to help, and they need to be just helped to help. We need to help them, make it easy for them to know how they can support. Maybe they can sign a petition. Maybe they can write a letter to the, their member of parliament, uh, to a representative, council representative, but maybe they can also make a donation, and maybe they want to, but we're not helping them to give a donation. Um, I love this, this quote here from Edmund Burke. I'm going to paraphrase it, I think. But he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And I would say no good happens with money. We know that um, 
we hear a lot about you know how money does bad but actually money can do good fundraising can make good happen um for instance people might not even know about the work or the need you're feeling too shy to go to someone but once they hear about your work and, the, and you make that connection person to person maybe Maybe they've learned something that they didn't know before. Maybe they want to help, or maybe they know someone who can help. Um, we hear in the news a lot about the bad people in the world. Of course, the world is full of corruption and evil people. But in my experience, and I've, I haven't worked just in the UK, I've worked in the Gulf, I've worked in the States and in Europe, and people are generally good. Um, thousands of charities in the world are only able to deliver their services because of voluntary donations, because individuals, maybe through trusts or foundations, but individuals are making decisions, emotional decisions, I would say, giving money to help. Um, people want to help if they see a clear need and a clear solution. Philanthropy is another buzzword, but um, I'm gonna move on from that, I think. Uh, we've talked about gifts in time as well, uh, about we're all volunteers, of course, You're, you guys are volunteers, so we know the importance of that, the time it takes, um, and the difference that volunteering can make. Um, gifts in kind, I've already mentioned, um, maybe asking um, venues if they can donate a hall, donate a space for you to host an event. Um, maybe local uh, catering companies can be asked to donate refreshments and you can of course recognize that, you can give them credit for the support they've given. That would be a, a good way for them to show their customers that they, ha they, are, they have corporate social responsibility is the, is the buzzword. Um, it could be stationary items for workshops, um, free travel. Um, perhaps I'm pushing this, but I would say that I'm a fundraiser, you're fundraisers, and we're all fundraisers. We might not know it, but when we're talking about our work, we are, and keep repeating myself, but we are talking to another human being. We're making a connection, we're tapping into their empathy, and always thinking about that that work needs investment. It won't happen without support. Um, so don't be shamed and don't be shy. People want to help, and we're just there to be bridges. Um, just back to that slide, um, sorry, I've, just to explain why I talked about being a bad fundraiser, um, I sometimes joke about this, that I am a bad fundraiser, and, and this is slightly contradictory, I've said that the number one reason why people don't give, don't donate, is because they're not asked. I, I try very hard, with major donor fundraising especially, never to ask for money. If I have to ask someone that I've built a relationship over a long time, I've built the trust, I've talked, they understand the work, of the charity and they trust the work of the charity. If I have to ask for the donation, I'm not doing my job. Um, and I'm always afraid of this low ball of the go away gift. Um, and I have in my, I have occasionally when somebody has got out a checkbook in the first or second meeting too soon in that journey, I said, thank you so much, but please put away your checkbook. Please, we actually don't need your donation at the moment, but we might need it in the future. We might need it in the next quarter for this project. And they're always amazed and surprised, like, really? Because you're a fundraiser, you know, I must be a bad fundraiser. But without exception, that has helped a relationship. They've understood that I'm not just going there for their money. It's about that relationship, about them, about keeping them, bringing them close to the charity's work, inviting them to events, introducing them to project staff, to key people in the organization. And then later, six months down the line, one year, two years down the line, you can go to them when you really need their help and say, can you give? Can you help us with this project? We need this much money. And it will be 10 times as much, 20 times as much in my experience as that check that they were about to write me two years previously. It sounds hard. And this is what I meant by being a bad fundraiser. I don't always uh, go out there asking for money. For me, I just want to get to know people and I want them to get to know me and the, and the charity that I'm working with. Um, thank you is the next slide. Thank you, goodbye, but it's not the end. This was a trick slide. Next slide, please. It's another guiding principle. Uh, when should you say thank you? I think I've given you the answer, but would anyone like to tell me in relation to fundraising when you should say thank you? Hello? Hello? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the, the first time to say thank you will be uh, as soon as uh, that uh, request has been granted, at least, uh, that's, at least that's the first point, that um, you'll be able to convince them to, uh, to support the, the project. Uh, I think the next thing should be thank you. And then uh, again, after the, comp the completion of the project, you have to go back to them to say thank you, maybe in a more formal manner now, at least. 
yeah, that's interesting about formal and, and informal. Um, Patricia, you've raised your hand. Yeah. Um, uh, just to add on what uh, Falu has said, yeah, the first time when uh, they have given you what you were asking for, and I think a second time can be when you have used the, the assistance that you got from them, you have used it and then whatever project you were doing has been successful and then you want to share with them uh, how successful the project has been because of their help. I think that's also another way to encourage uh, uh, donors so that they should keep on assisting you because they feel uh, they feel that they have made a difference in what you are doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I well, feel I'm, that I'm, feedback is also very important. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Well, I'm happy to say that you're both both right, of course, and I'm sad to say that you're both wrong. Think about this. When you're approaching someone and asking for their time, I would say straight away, beginning, before I've even thought about asking for the money, I would say, thank you for meeting me. Thank you for your time. If I'm writing a letter to a potential funder, if that's a, a trust, a company, I would say, thank you for, um, for reading this letter. I mean, maybe that's very bad English, but you get my point. You know, very <laughs> exactly. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Sorry? I did say well. Until we you do we should say. Oh. I've lost the presentation, Maria. Can people uh, see? Ah. Yeah. Yes. Maria, I've lost the presentation. Can others still see the presentation? Because my screen has gone. I've lost everybody. Just reopening Teams, weirdly. Yes, I can see it. That's strange. OK, I'll just have to. I'm looking at a blank screen, but I can see the slides on my other uh, machine. Uh, so can you see now guiding principles? When should you say thank you? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a trick question. Um, the thanking, uh, you should thank when you've received a gift, but it's not the end of the process. For me, it's always the beginning of a cycle. Remember, we're not looking for transactional gifts or one-off gifts. We're looking for long-term investment. So for me, it's the beginning of that cycle of giving. Of, of giving. Um, when I send a thank you letter after a donation, for me, that's not the end. Um, for me, that's the beginning of the next proposal the next time I'm going to ask for money. It's about that cultivation. It's about looking after your seedlings. It's about that relationship. And we have a saying in English, you can't say thank you enough. Um, I would say yes, but I have a rule of three. Um, and it's interesting with, with, with teams that I manage, I always have an exercise quite early on where we create a template thank you letter that we can just go to and always use. Um, and we have to ensure that we say three times thank you in that letter. So you would start, for instance, by saying, well, I'll say what we don't do. Um, you know, dear so-and-so, we received your donation. We will use it to plan the project. We will update you after the project's end. Um, obviously, I'm simplifying, but I would avoid that kind of language. I would start the letter by saying, dear John, I, I hope you'll be on first name terms by that point. Dear sir, dear madam, I hope it won't be dear sir or madam. And um, thank you for your very kind donation. You start, the first word is thank you. And in the middle of the, the letter, it's only a thank you letter, so it doesn't have to be an essay, but it should be a couple of paragraphs. In the middle, you would say something like, for instance, you know, we're grateful that your kind gift is enabling us to deliver the project, organize an event, whatever that, that might be. Um, or, you know, the, we talk about the outcomes, we talk about the work, only possible with your generous donation, that uh, generous support. That's a way of saying thank you. And at the end, I would sign off by saying, I, I would say, depending on who it is and how I'm feeling, you know, my thanks again, my immense thanks, our heartfelt thanks again. Um, thank you so much again. Really grateful, really appreciate it. So I was, obviously you can say thank you enough. And I would say, ensuring that you say three times in that correspondence um, works really well. People love to be thanked. People will say, I, I hear people say, no need to thank me. I don't need to be thanked. Uh, it's no problem. But I don't believe people really mean it. Everybody likes to be thanked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we're on to pitfalls and tips. Can you see pitfalls, tips on your screens? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, yeah, I wonder what happened there. It's very strange. Um, because I'm still on this call, obviously, because you can hear me and I can hear you, but I've, I've lost the presentation. It's very bizarre. Bear with me. I might just... 
No, anyway. Um, funders who look for an excuse to reject you. This is something that I've heard a lot from um, trustees of trusts, for instance, and administrators of trusts and foundations. Obviously, it's a very competitive market. Um, as soon as there's any hint that a trust has some money that they're going to give out or that an individual um, has come into some wealth or is in a position to help, they will get bombarded with applications or with calls or with approaches. You have to be competitive. You have to be as innovative as possible. We come back to those principles, to be honest, to be transparent, to think about the relationship and not just going in and asking for money straight away. Um, some of the examples I've had, um, a trust, you know, they, they, the post comes, the post person delivers the, the applications. There's a pile of 100 applications on one day and they open it. And if they see a mistake, if they see a spelling mistake, if they haven't addressed it to the right person, if they haven't done their research, if it doesn't match any published criteria, for instance, it just goes into the bin. I've heard directors and administrators of trusts and foundations saying this to me, it will just go into the bin. Even if the work is amazing, even if the people doing the work are passionate and talented, you have one chance to connect with someone. And if you just fall into those pits, those pitfalls, um, you're wasting that opportunity. So it might seem obvious, um, Communication is obviously key. Uh, key. You need to idea. We're all writers. Um, we know about having a second pair of eyes, even if that second pair of eyes is yours. So I will often, I will write an email, I will write a proposal, and I will either ask for one of my colleagues to read it, to check for typos or for obvious mistakes that I've missed uh, because I'm too close to it, or I will even come back to it the next day. And the next morning, I will read it. I often try to pretend that I'm sitting in the trust's office and that I am the trust's admi administrator opening my letter and reading it for the first time. Does it look, does it look readable? Is it, has it got a few pictures, photos, images on it, or infographics? Is there too much text and not enough margin? You know, you need space around the words. You need to make it as easy as possible for the reader to connect with what you're talking about, that you don't want to put up obstacles. Um, you would find the name of the contact person if possible. Please try to avoid writing to a company or foundation saying, dear sir, dear sir, madam, dear director, dear manager, try to find out the name of a person that it will get to and be opened by an individual, that personal contact. Um, same with arts council, same, same with embassies that you might um, be in a position to apply for funding in your local areas. Um, leave it out, another English phrase. And we all know this is writers or editors as well. When you're uh, trying to convey a message um, try and, what you leave out in your writing is often just as important as what you leave in. You need to carve, you know, like a, scu a sculpture. You don't want the, the, the marble, the granite. You want to carve something beautiful and, and, and that's going to inspire people and be clear. You can't say it all. I, I know that as, uh, uh, as project deliverers, we're all really passionate about everything that we do uh, and the importance of the work. But you have a very short space of time or you have a very... Um, short space on the on the application form, for instance, you can't say it all. You need to think very carefully about what to leave out um, to tell the story. Make sure you do your research, look at criteria, look at if there's an affinity between what you're doing and the organization or the individual that you're approaching. Um, don't waste your time and that person's time by a failure of research. Do your due diligence. Due diligence is, is another one of those um, terminology is one of those buzzwords that we hear a lot about and for me it means two things it means ethical fundraising uh, we don't want to be coming going to one of those global corporates that's doing reputational damage in your you know doing environmental damage in your country and maybe doing reputational damage for you uh, in the wider world um, there's also now more than ever the ethics of data usage when we're taking people's details um, we all need to think about how are we storing um, people's names, email addresses, phone numbers, um, the, the information about the amount that they've donated to you needs to be um, confidential, needs to be password protected. We do need to think about the ethics of, uh, of data. Uh, uh, oh, is that you? There's a feedback somewhere. Okay. Um, 
Maybe it's following. Uh, so uh, a little tip as well. Um, there's a tendency, you know, you work hard on an application or maybe 20 applications, you send it out of the door, you think, phew, wow, I've done the work, and you forget about it, and you pray, you hope that somebody will send a donation. I wouldn't do that. I would follow it up. Um, I, I would be have patience and I would have persistence. I would check that the person has received the email, has received the application form, um, and check that they have all the information that they need to, to make a decision. Um, thanking, ensuring that thanking is timely and appropriate. We've talked about that. Um, already. Very quickly, the next slide, uh, continuing tips, a question, um, what do donors get back? Um, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm going to move on with this. I'm going to say, well, yes, of course, um, you'll send them a report, um, you'll invite them to an event, but donors get a good feeling about what they're doing. Let, 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 that's kind of that, that's linked to philanthropy and why people give philanthropic gifts. It's because it makes them feel good. They want to help. People are generally good. Everybody likes to be thanked, so thank thank you letter, thank you card. Um, they want to tell their friends and colleagues about what they've done. Um, you can send a letter from somebody high up in your organization. That always feels nice. Um, think about how you can recognize and celebrate support. So for instance, you could have people's names or organization names on your materials, slides, uh, on your social media if you have that. Um, or you can invite them to an event. I'd say inviting people, uh, donors to events is, is the best. You get to meet them in person. They get to, you get to connect person to person, as I've said. Um, I also send cards. Um, sometimes instead of a formal thank you letter, instead of an email, I will just make or buy a little postcard or a little card and I'll, I'll, I'll handwrite a personal message, you know, how their gift touched me and how grateful I am on behalf of the charity that they've made this investment, this, they've sent this gift, which I see as an emotional investment. I don't put that on the card, but I think it's really important to have that, that personal connection. Um, next slide, please. Um, five was and a how. This I just find an, a, a neat little handy tool, to uh, framework to summarize what we've talked about um, and have it in mind if it's helpful. You know, why? Why the work? Um, I think that's what we would call the case for support. I'll come on to templates in a minute. Um, and why the donor? Why are you going to that person or organization? Is there an affinity? Do they have the capacity? Do your due diligence. Um, who? I mean, who is the best person to make that approach and to do the ask? It might not be you, it might be somebody you know. Peer-to-peer um, -peer asks are always really strong. Um, have a think as well about any of the higher profile um, writers in your network. So anybody, a writer who might be in the news at that time or might be about to, to publish something. Um, is it addressed to the right person? I've mentioned that. Um, where should the ask take place? Event is a good place to work on that relationship, to, to, to do that cultivation. Even cafes, a lot of my face-to-face -face work, face -face work is in cafes. It's informal, it puts people at ease, um, people relax and, you have, and you're able to build that relationship and build that trust. Sometimes I've, I've been invited to um, the offices of donors, to their businesses. Um, better if you can invite them to your office, then they can see the real operation, they can see real people at their desks doing the work. Um, seeing is believing is another buzzword in, in the charity community. That really means just showing the work. You know, donors are not going to be inspired if they're reading a dry report with lots of statistics and lots of bullet points. You know, they need to come and see the project, meet the, meet the people delivering the work, the facilitators, and meet some of the, the people attending those projects. Um, now remote, I think this is a challenge. I don't have the answer for this of how we uh, try to make that connection when we can't meet people in, uh, as we used to be able to. Um, when, when to make the ask. I've said, don't ask too soon, not on the first meeting um, or communication. Um, we're looking for to ripen the fruit, back to the agricultural analogy, it's about cultivation. Don't pick it too soon, it won't be ready, it won't be ripe. Wait for it to ripen. Wait for the donor to be ready to make a transformative gift, a transformational gift. Um, transformational, another buzzword, sorry, um, which I should have included, but um, for me, that's again, my ambition is to secure transformational gifts for, for Penn and for other organizations. Um, that's when it's so significant to the person, it's such an emotional investment as well as financial, that it's transformative both to the, to the organization because it will allow them to, to employ someone or to deliver a project they, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to deliver. But it's also transformational or transformative for the person giving. When you give 
what is to you a major donation, it's a real emotional investment. It's a real, it's a big thing. Never, even if you're wealthy, giving a large amount of money to a charity is a really important personal thing that you will talk with your family about around the dinner table. You know, it's not, it's not a transaction, I would say. Um, where are we now? When? Yeah, can you organize events around key dates in, in the pen calendar? So it's, of course, we have Day of the Imprisoned Red now. If you have activities around that, if you have communications around that, I'd say that's a perfect opportunity to uh, raise awareness of the work, to give people an opportunity to support that work. Um, I don't have the dates, but there's all these days throughout the year, International Day of Women, International Day of Poetry, etc. cetera. Um, Human Rights Day, I think is coming up too in November, December. Um, what, you know, what are you using to make that ask? It can be a flyer, it can be a short proposal, never more than one or two pages. Um, it might be a conversation, it might be a short video to demonstrate the work, to bring it to life. How, is it an application, is it a pitch, is it an event? Um, this is starting to think about ideas for raising money. Have we thought about doing coffee mornings in the UK and Europe? These are very popular. Um, developing community support for the work. People uh, get together as a group, um, have a coffee morning, share stories, um, and through their own separate networks, come together as a group to, to raise funds for organizations. Cake bake sales. This is all very small, but it all can, um, all can connect and all can come together to get the, the work known through the community and to try and reach those new networks that otherwise, otherwise you wouldn't perhaps connect to. Um, how, tell a story, as I've said, try and avoid uh, dry uh, statistics, um, try and bring the work to life. You're talking human to human, the human angle, empathy. Um, almost ready for the interactive bit. Sorry I'm, I'm, that you're listening, having to listen to my voice so much. Um, so template and pitch. Now, the most obvious, you know, the most important thing about what we do is obviously the work. Um, the second thing is to be able to sell it. Now, I know it's not a product, but we are selling actually. Fundraisers are salespeople in a sense. We're selling values. We're selling an idea. We're selling a vision of the work. It's the mission of the organization. Um, it's about laying out our stall, if you like. Why should people invest? What, are they, uh, what do we want them to become involved with over a long period? And I'd split this into two ways that you can make that connection. Of course, it's in writing and it's in person. In writing, we talk about templates. Next slide, please. Um, templates, obviously a technical term in, print, in printing. Um, here it's what we mean by our case for support, our case statement, which is why should people invest in that work? Why should people donate to that project? Or to that activity. Uh, it's another buzzword. Um, so here are a few elements to consider. Um, I'd say having a template is a very useful tool for you. Don't reinvent the wheel. I've worked with people who every time they're asked to send some information about the work to a donor or to an organization, they start typing from scratch, from the beginning. I call that reinventing the wheel. No need to do that. Have a template. Um, one page is two pages summarizing your work, which you can just top and tail which you can just use anytime anybody asks you for information. It saves time and effort. Um, it should be two pages max is, is the kind of recommended one from, from funders internationally. Uh, there should be a summary of the problem identified and what you're aiming to address. Maybe a line about pen generally, but not too much. Um, project description, how are you going to address the, the problem? What is the project? How are you addressing that identified need? Um, how will you know you're making a difference? Now, of course, this ties in with the monitoring and evaluation um, webinar you've already been to. Um, it's about the, uh, the evaluation, it's about the story of change that you've heard about. Um, how will you know that you're making a difference and how do you communicate that? Now, I've worked with, with, with project staff for many, many years and everybody knows that they're doing good, that it's made a change, that the project was successful. And they say to me, well, we just know it. Of course it was successful. Everybody was really happy. Everybody said very positive things, but you need to be able to demonstrate that to, to funders. Um, you know, but how do you demonstrate to others? Um, have a case study in there, bring it to life, a success story. What went well? Um, how much will it cost? It just doesn't need to be a very complicated budget. It's, we're not, you know, when you're talking to, to an individual or a trust, just an indication that you've thought about how much it's going to, 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 to cost. We've talked about including um, overheads and admin costs. Um, 
include evaluation costs, include a budget line, which is where we need to do a little bit of evaluation afterwards to check that we're doing the right thing. Uh, what do we need to change when we try and uh, deliver the project in the future? Um, how are we going to talk about the world work? Dissemination of results, maybe include that in your budget that you want to produce a report. Uh, and of course, include a thank you. Um, next slide, another buzzword, you hear about the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch usually means if you have 30 seconds in an elevator, in a lift, uh, with a rich person, what would you say about the work if you only have 30 seconds? Now, um, I hope this is the time when we all get to share and have a go at fundraising ourselves. I'm looking forward to this bit. Um, I hope you're all willing and able and enthusiastic. Um, I'm going to extend this to, to one minute. Um, and the task, which I think you were written about before the session, I think Maria wrote to you, um, and I'm going to give you a few minutes of silence just to think about this as well and make some notes, make some bullet points, perhaps just, just cues for yourself. Um, imagine that you're introduced to a wealthy individual and you know that they have the capacity and the means to give a transformational gift, a large gift um, to your organisation. You have a minute. What do you say? Um, just a reminder, you know, what you miss out is sometimes as important as what you keep in. Um, and at this stage, here's a clue. What is the ask? You're meeting them for the first time. You only have a minute. What is the ask? Um, so I'm going to give you five minutes now to, to have a think. Um, I'd hope that we could go out into side sessions and do this in one-to-ones, which we would do if we were sitting in a room together. Um, that's not possible. So if that's okay, take a few minutes um, and we'll reconvene. Um, and I'll be asking for volunteers. Um, do we have any volunteers? to go first, otherwise I'll pick on someone. Okay, I will go first. Thank you. Okay, okay. Oh, I came up with three, three points for that 30 seconds encounter. And uh, my first approach would be to start by saying to that person that uh, we appreciate the work he's doing in his field and also the work he's doing as a philanthropist. I would ask him to help me build the future like of my country like he's doing. And our vision for that is to help the future by helping talented young guys and girls to pursue their dreams. So I would ask him to be part of our dreams. And then I would invite him whether either to come to our place and meet, or I would send him information to present my organization and my goals, and also give him my visit card and uh, so that he can know who he's talking about, uh, who he's talking to. Okay, thank you. That's a lot in there. I think if you only had 30 seconds and you were actually talking to that person, it would it, it would it would be too much, unfortunately. This is the this is the challenge of this task. Actually, it's it's one minute, so you would have sixty seconds, a little more. Um, thank you so much for being first to go. If others could think about uh, not describing what they would say, but talk to me. I'm very rich. I have lots of money, and you meet me, and you have one minute. Talk to me. What are you going to tell me? What are you going to ask of me? Who'd like to go next? Abdullah. Yeah, I think I would follow the, the rule that says, uh, don't try to kiss on the first date. So, <laughs> <laughs> therefore, what I would do is, uh, probably to, to, to name the person by his name and um, ask for an opportunity to meet him or invite him to visit our work. So this would give, give me an opportunity to, 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 while not kissing on the first date, to, to tell him what, what we really intend to do in a longer time. So this is what I would like to do. Okay, so you've met him, you've met me, and you've asked if I will meet with you, but I don't know who you are. Why would I meet you? Well, this is, this is very important, actually. Uh, 
Of course, when I um, I address you, I will tell you who I am, what I do, yeah. and ask for a meeting or yeah. invite you to visit me. Yeah. Okay. I really want um, people yeah. to try to pretend that they're in that scenario. Imagine that you are in that space, and don't tell me what you would do. Talk to me as if I am rich, and if you're Salva, would you like to have a go? Um, I think what Paul means is you should say, hi, Paul, my name is Salwa. Um, I work at Penn International. We fight for freedom of, of expression and literature. And I would, really I would really like for you to come and visit our organization and see how, to work, how, you, how we work and how you can help us. Something similar to that, right, Paul? Salwa, that was a pleasure to hear from you. I'd love to meet with you. Give yeah. me your card. <laughs> A role yeah, play. May I please? May I please? Mahan, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. I have written my comment to Anne uh, privately. Okay, just I'm telling you again here. Uh, just uh, uh, greetings, uh, the person. Just uh, hello, Paul. Uh, hello. The, I'm uh, Secretary General of Aid Bangladesh. I'm happy to meet you here. I would like to just get your uh, uh, business card just to communicate with you. Right. So tell me a little uh, bit. What, what do you do? What's been, been, what has been? I'll just inform him. Just I am in, uh, informing you that I am the Secretary General of Pen Bangladesh. Right. Yeah. Uh, what, okay. What's Pen Bangladesh? What do you do? Pen Center. Pen, Pen, Pen Bangladesh Center. Right. What does yeah. Pen do? Uh, I'm just, sorry. Uh, I'm, really busy. I'm really busy and I need to go yeah, soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, give yeah. me your card. But what does Pen do? The pen is actually doing with the freedom of expression and literature and I'm okay. happy to meet you here and I just to get your uh, business card uh, just to communicate okay. with you. Oh, this sounds interesting. I'd like to find out more. Thank you. I'm sorry I was a little aggressive then, but I, you know what? I, I once, the biggest donation I ever had, one of the worst experiences of my life, and I came out feeling really depressed and dirty because I went into his office and he said, Again, it wasn't in a cafe, it wasn't informal, it was very formal. I had to go to his office, he was in his space. And he said to me, right, why are you here? Why are you here? Very aggressive. And I, and I only had two minutes with this guy. Um, and he did write the check. He didn't get, you know, he gave the check because he wanted to um, sit next to a famous person at one of our events, not because he cared about the work. He wasn't making any kind of emotional investment in it. It was a large check, but it was awful. Um, so I'm sorry, but... That's how some of these people are. They've, they, 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 I hear from major donors that they are, um, they have money, but they are time poor. They don't have much time. They're very busy people, and they will say, "Make it quick." I don't have much time. You've got two minutes, and that's that's your pitch. That's all you have to really make make a statement and convey something. Um, so I'm sorry if, if in this role play, um, I take my amateur acting too far. Who would like to go next? I feel that I feel that Lamia is thinking about it. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I think I would probably start with that that I am uh, working at the, the from Pan Bosnia that we have been established during the war, so in 1992, and uh, m most of our founders now um, are actually uh, really famous authors that. Uh, are bestsellers in the world or in the region and have uh, also uh, um, likewise uh, uh, influence in literature, in, in the cultural scene, but also in political scene. And uh, that uh, we have uh, witnessed some idle years in our center, but uh, we uh, are coming back with some new projects, which I would like to present. Okay. Uh, um, considering the, um, well, taking the stance of uh, protecting cultural workers in Bosnian society. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I would start if I walked into that elevator and I was with this, I would start by saying, hi, what, what are the chances of meeting you? Do you mind if I just introduce myself? Please give me a minute of your time. I work with Penn. You know, this Penn Center, really important work, really crucial that we do this. 
and we have this event, we have this project, please can I send you some information? Please can, please can I meet with you for, for 10 minutes just to tell you a little bit more about the work? Um, to try and make that personal connection with someone. Don't go too much into the detail, the history of the work. Just try and in the first stage, just make some kind of personal connection. Um, again and again in my meetings with major donors, I'm amazed. I, I will always prepare some project information uh, or case studies. And it amazes me, people often, donors often don't want to hear about that. They just want to make that connection. How are you? How are things going at Penn? What are your plans? What, if they don't want to know, because they can read about the project information. This is something different. This is a personal connection. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, everybody is gonna have a go before they're allowed to go off this Zoom call, I have to say. So you can go first or you can go last. <laughs> Somebody said go last. <laughs> Kathleen, would you like to have a go or? Oh, can't hear you. Did I, I did miss already. it? I did already. I did already, sorry. Jorn, would you like to meet me? Jorn, hello. What have you got to say to me? Oh, uh, he's, he's run away. <laughs> no, he's here. Okay. <laughs> what well, I'm just thinking hi. about. Hi. Uh, I would say like, uh, hello, Paul. Yeah. I'm Yon Yan, the president of Pen Cambodia. And now we are planning to produce a program for promote the freedom of uh, writers in Cambodia. Okay. It's called like to share the experience about how to express the freedom. So this program needs some fun to process. So it is around one week's long training course. So we need fund around uh, 20,000 for uh, traveling, uh, transporting and all expense. Right. So it, I'm sorry, I have to stop so, you. I'm very busy. I'm very important and very busy. How can I, how can I help you? Yeah, it, 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 it do, if, if you don't mind, please help <laughs> donate some uh, budget for this program because it is very really important mm -hmm. for, uh, for freedom of expression is motivate people to share knowledge right. about their thinking to develop our society and okay. country as well. Okay, well, I'd need to know more. So how about this? How about you come and meet me tomorrow for lunch and we'll talk more. That's the outcome that you want. You want to have that chance to meet for a longer period, not just one minute where you're nervous and you're trying to think, oh, what should I say? Try and get that meeting. Try and make that second connection. Um, who, who has escaped this challenge so far? Emo? Or I can't see everybody. I'm looking at the list. Yeah, Amo and Patricia also. Okay. They're hiding, but we won't let them escape. It's a good, I think it's fun and it's a good thing to practice. It's a good thing. Emo to... is having problems with okay. her okay. Uh, internet, so she might struggle. Uh, has Patricia yeah. spoken? Ah, hello again. Hi. Um, it's not a very easy task, really. It's not an easy task because especially, especially because I was trying to think around. <laughs> if we were in, if Sorry? we were in a room, you... it would be easier, I think. And if we got yeah. a little bit, uh, of... because Sorry. maybe if I if I knew a little bit about the the donor what they do, what they are passionate about. Maybe yeah. I would know how to start yeah. this conversation. But then I'm thinking I've met a, I've met a total stranger. This is a total yeah. stranger and <laughs> I'm no, like, how do I start? It's some, it's someone you, you, know? you say you know a little bit about them. So you can say, excuse me, do you mind if I introduce myself? And then what, what else would you say to this person you know is wealthy? 
Well, if I introduce myself first, or maybe we already know each other from a, a previous experience or encounter, then I'll I'll just show them how excited about how excited I am about a current project, you know. And uh, we hope we are going to to change a lot of lives, or we are going to bring this uh, uh, some sort of impact to the community. Uh, would you want to be part of it? Or oh, that's a good line. Do you wanna, <laughs> yeah, do you want to be part of it? Or do you want to be part of the success story? And then if the person has time, I will tell them more. But yes. if I see that they don't have time, then I'll try to create an opportunity yeah. so that I meet them and I tell them more so that I bring them on board. You know, a minute is up. A minute goes by very, very fast. But yeah, was, and I'm done. Part of it. Can you meet them? Sorry? A beautiful smile. I'm sure they would want to meet with you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, okay. I Thank think we've got through everybody. Well, I'm sorry if, if that made people feel um, uncomfortable, but I do think it's really... F follow, um, Paul? I yeah, think. follow. Oh, sorry, did I miss follow? Oh, look, he's smiling because he thought he'd escaped. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, for the, this is it. You're the main show now. Unmute yourself. You need to mute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I'm, I'm so delighted to, to meet you. I've uh, really been really about you, about your, your passion, especially for, for the children. And uh, the, the, it happens to... Your, your passion uh, happens to, to be in sync with what we are doing in Penn uh, International. Uh, I'm, I'm Folu, uh, the Nigerian uh, president of Penn. Uh, and then um, I know you want to uh, align with us because we, Penn is about uh, the promotion of literature, literacy, and, and then uh, free speech, freedom of expression. And so uh, we are currently into a project uh, to develop, develop the a particular uh, community, rural community uh, in Lagos, uh, which is uh, really mainly a migrant community, and then we know that uh, there's no 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 social facility like even education and uh, school or hospital there. And we're trying to now uh, um, start a little school, a little um, um, something of a school really uh, there, which might not be a very formal. Uh, thing and so it could be just to get some facilitators to be teaching reading and writing and eventually getting some people to get have, develop interest in literature and i um i would Stop like you, i need uh, to, to now. have i'm very rich and i'm very important and i need to go so oh yes uh, okay so, 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 like so yeah please I, I would like to to book an appointment to come and see you maybe in your office or somewhere so that we okay. could discuss give me your this card, give me your number my secretary will call you <laughs> okay yeah thank you very much thank you for that that's very good effort i like that very good thank you <laughs> well thank you all and maybe this is something you could practice with your family or friends something to just i mean i know it seems silly and it's a game but actually it's really important if you you know to be able to encapsulate to communicate what you do in a very short period of time it's a busy world people are very busy they have other priorities other many other charities i'm sure are asking them for money if they're wealthy um it's just i think really helpful to you to be able to uh, understand how to communicate your own work in a very short so i'm very sorry that if it was if it seemed a little bit um embarrassing or aggressive and short but i think it's a really useful exercise um We've, we've run over time very significantly. I'll just go through very quickly uh, the resources slide, um, Maria. That's okay? Yes. I can't see if it's on screen or not, sorry, because... Oh, no, I can see, thank you. So slide 24. Um, so we're trying... That's it. Um, so we've talked, uh, the census have talked to everybody about uh, the importance of Penn International, but actually um, we are trying really, really hard to fundraise on that global level. Um, it's a very small team. It's, it's me, half of another person, um, trying to use Penn's centenary next year as a way to get new interest, new engagement and new funders. Um, but I think 
what Romana said to me is that in the future, it might be that we uh, want to give grants to centers to develop bigger projects over a longer period, um, which means we might not be able to support as many as centers. Um, so it's gonna be bigger work, longer periods, fewer centers, um, unless we can somehow raise new money, which is really, really challenging, obviously. Um, so it's really important that centers start thinking, start planning, start being creative about how they can fundraise locally. Um, I, me I mentioned center twinning. Um, I hope there'll be more of that um, at the Congress next week, if you're in, um, registered with the annual Congress, which starts on Monday. Um, but we're interested very much in pushing center twinning. There's already some successful models of this. It might be that you twin with a center in your region, for instance, to do a consortium bid. Sometimes it's, it's much stronger to go as a group of different centers in the same region to that funder, and that will be stronger um, and give you a better chance of getting funds rather than just one center. Um, so think about center twinning. Um, I, it might be better if I do a follow-up email, but there are lots of resources online um, where you can see lists of funders. There's Funding Central, uh, trustfunding.org. In the UK, there's the Charity Commission. In Scotland, there's the Office of the Scottish Charity Register. Um, of course, this is UK-based, but you'll find a lot of them do support international projects. And in many cases, it's not international charities, but it will be local charities, local centres um, that can apply for funds directly for their work. So that's worth having a look at. These are free resources. Um, there's the European Foundation Network. Um, do have a look at your local libraries. Um, often they have those kind of, the librarian will be able to advise you and often they keep directories of companies, funders. Um, have a think about your local businesses. Now I was thinking about this, even it could be, you, there's a, a restaurant that's local. You could maybe speak to the owner um, if they're willing to give a percentage of, of what they sell to your charity. So it, this is good for their customers. It, it shows that they're supporting a charity that they're socially minded, that they have social responsibility. Um, and it's, it's not hard for them to give a percentage of, their, um, of one of the meals on their menu, for instance, to that charity. It will be small amounts, but it will build up and it will raise awareness of your charity as well. It will raise awareness of your project and your center uh, in the community. Um, have a think about law firms. Of course, legal, you know, human rights law is very important, a, a part of freedom of expression globally. Perhaps you can go to your local solicitors, local law firms and ask if they have a fund. Um, in Europe, uh, solicitors firms often have a charitable committee um, that give grants to local organizations as well. So it's worth doing some research on your local law firms. Um, have a think about your local community. Schools often have budgets uh, to do kind of literary um, projects for their pupils. Perhaps there's a way that you can partner with the centre, with local schools, and get some funding that way uh, to provide resources, to provide workshops and sessions uh, through the work of Penn and our values. Um, have a think about religious centres. That might be churches, it might be mosques, it might be a synagogue. Um, often it's possible to make a relationship with the imam or with the, um, with the priest of the church uh, and ask them to do a collection for your charity. Um, ask them to ask if you can put up um, leaflets and information about the center and the project on the notice boards in the mosque, in the church, whatever it might be. Um, embassies um, often have pots of money for local initiatives. So do some research on your local embassy and on the grants that you might be able to access, um, access there. Government departments, we've talked about that earlier as well. And perhaps through center twinning, perhaps in future sessions or future communications, we'll find a way to support each other in terms of how to uh, access and identify any funding that there might be in uh, different government departments. And there's also arts councils. Um, obviously, the arts are suffering financially at the moment, um, so they'll be bombarded, but there might be a way that you can find a space, make a connection with somebody at, at your local arts councils. Um, there's an organization called the Institute of Fundraising. Uh, if you're interested, they have lots of free resources. They have training materials. They have codes of practice um, for all the different kinds of fundraising, corporate fundraising, major donor fundraising, trust fundraising, etc. cetera. Um, they have a campaign as well, hashtag proud to be a fundraiser, um, which is interesting. Um, in terms of trusts, 
one of the sector experts is a man called Bill Bruti. He has a company called Fundraising Training Limited. It's worth looking at their website. They have uh, online training events specifically on how to write trust proposals, uh, which will build on something that I kind of touched upon briefly uh, at the beginning of this session. Um, how to do major donor fundraising. I think the best and shortest book is by Margaret Holman and, and Lucy Sargent. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Um, that's a really interesting read. Again, that covers some of the stuff that I've mentioned. Um, there's an online resource, Chronicle of Philanthropy. There's a, it goes on. I mean, perhaps I'll, it might be helpful for me to put an email together uh, with a kind of, um, not a bibliography, but with some references um, after the session. Um, I also, I mean, this is terminology and buzzwords again, but there's a massive industry in fundraising for the larger international charities using behavioral economics using the same methodologies that you that marketing companies use to sell product, uh, you can use that for fundraising. Um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, um, kind of psychological theories are also uh, used a lot in, in fundraising as well, how to persuade people to give. Um, so perhaps those might be interesting future sessions um, once we have the debrief from the feedback. Um, I think given the time, I'm gonna just go to the last slide and say, Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you for your contributions. Um, and remember, thank you is not the end. It's the beginning. Um, go and sow your seeds, go and start a relationship. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm happy to hear any, any questions now, any feedback. I'm just very conscious that we run over time, but. I don't want to shut down the session, just to let you know, I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Paul? I don't have a question. Yes. I have a question, but I have a comment. <clears throat> I understand from that brief presentation that fundraising is an art in itself and is also something that needs dedication. You have to have of person or a team working because the, 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 to me the word here is follow up. It's not just getting money but building a relationship and following up and it takes time and dedication and you have to remember to do it all the time. Yeah it's it's hard I'm not saying it's easy and that's why you know maybe we think about volunteers and just getting people to contribute not financially but just to be able to help you to do that research, to make those templates, to, to keep those relationships. But I, I don't underestimate how challenging it is. Salwa had a, a question, I think. Salwa and then Patricia. Um, it's really a comment. And I think uh, most of the centers that are here, uh, most of you already been funded by Pan International. And I think that's a basis, a starting point for you. You already have that relationship with Penn. You can already have, you already have something to practice with. Um, because Penn being your funders, you've, uh, you've applied to them, you're in uh, regular contact with them, you report to them. And I also want to emphasize um, the connection between fundraising, communication, and also financial reporting. All these things are all intertwined. You all have practice in this area. It's just building up on that. That's all. Patricia, did you still have a? Yes, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. It's not a question. Uh, I think uh, today's uh, webinar was uh, quite informative and uh, not having brain clacking as well, because it's not something that we, we do every day. It's uh, like someone already stated, it needs practice. One has to acquire those skills. So I hope it's not a one-off thing. Uh, I think uh, I'm speaking as a member of Penn Malawi, we would need more of such sessions and also maybe exercises just to help us practice. It's, um, it's, it's a skill that one has to attain over time. It's not a one-off thing. Uh, my experience has been that uh, it needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of work and uh, people have to be 
uh, to be trained, to be knowledgeable on how to make money for a pen center. Because historically, we are used to being funded. We are used to being funded and uh, maybe that's why we haven't been empowered enough to, to raise money on our own. Now our focus on that was that we should be able to report better financial reports, you know, we need to show our success stories, you know, so this is a new area. This is a new area for uh, most pain centers, I suppose. So I think we'll need more, uh, more empowerment in this area. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. that's just a comment I, I wanted to share. Yeah. It's really interesting, Patricia, and I, I hear what you're saying. I think I might have failed in this session because what I was trying to convey is that it's not rocket science. You talk a lot about skills, but it really is just about connecting with the person, the way we do in our relationships. It, you know, it's, it's just about being able to communicate the work that we do, honestly and clearly. Um, and, and I think, you know, we do the work, we talk about the work all the time, um, and we shouldn't be nervous, we shouldn't be intimidated, we shouldn't feel that somehow... Um, you know, we don't need to do a degree in like, you know, it's not engineering, we're not building a car, we're just talking to other people about something that we're really passionate about and we believe in. And we're writers, we're creators, we work with language. You know, it's just another way uh, of telling a story. Yeah. Uh, Folu, I think, had uh, something to say. I think he raised his hand. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you very much for, for that uh, lecture. It's been so interesting. And as uh, Pat uh, actually said, uh, it's really uh, new to some of us. We've been, we've been at it for some time now, the pen projects and all that, but we've not really been very aggressive about fundraising, going out and meeting people because, well, we, um, you know, I, I'm from the academic community, and then I'm a writer, and, and then going out to start soliciting for funds again is something that some of us really um, uh, don't uh, really do. What, what we do mostly in Nigeria is to uh, look around for people who might have that kind of uh, maybe talent or something, look at, reach out to some uh, people, to companies and all that to uh, go and raise funds for us, which, uh, I must say, I haven't been too too successful in most of the time. So I'm, I, I want to um, seek your opinion on on this issue of really getting people to 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 do the running around for us, and then how to get them motivated, uh, if at least uh, maybe to fill in the gap. You know. Uh, uh, I mean, that's that's difficult. You can advertise, of course, for volunteers maybe in um, colleges, universities, people in their gap years, people in their summer holidays could help out, do some office volunteering. Um, you can ask around your family and friends if anybody wants to give some time. I think it's a really good thing for people to have on their CVs, you know, if people are ambitious and they want to have a, you know, a good career. I get applications all the time and it's always really important. It's, it's standard that you've done volunteering and that you've volunteered. In, Fundraising as well, it's, it's, there's a lot of transferable skills that you can use for other um, career development, you know, that you can do research, that you can compose copy, that you can edit, that, that you can organize an event. You know, there's lots of transferable skills. So I think it's about selling what you can give back to the volunteer, um, how to find volunteers that are, that are talented enough and confident enough without needing too much support. It, it's, it's not easy. I don't really have a magic answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Abdullahi? Thank you, Maria. I have a quick question. It is not only for Paul, but maybe for Maria and uh, Salwa, which is the following. Is it allowed by the uh, rules? A pen center to approach another pen center and ask for you know support for a specific project, like other member organizations such as uh, uh, Rotary do. Is it allowed? Can we do it? Can we? Um, I have some friends 
you know, in other countries, in, other, in European countries, who are members of, you know, the pen organization. Can I talk to them and ask them to support, you know, one specific project in my country? Is that allowed? This is the question. Thank if you. If there's a rule, if there's a rule, I would break it. Because PEN is a global movement. It's all about supporting writers, uh, promoting literature across borders. Um, I would be very shocked and surprised. And, and uh, what I understand is that we want centers to work more closely together and to support one another. It's about those more successful centers, I'd say Northern Hemisphere centers, supporting um, centers in the global south. And I'd say it's about centers in those regions supporting each other as well. We've already heard today that every center's got a different bit of experience, it's somehow raised funding in different ways that other centers might not have been able to, to do. So I think peer-to-peer -peer support, helping each other, connecting with each other is more important than listening to, to me, you know, talk about some of those theories. Um, I'd say yes, Salva, I think you've been with Penn the longest. Um, I don't know if you know anything I don't, but I am a rule breaker. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the question. I had some interruptions is, here. Yeah, is there any rules? Uh, Abdullah is asking, does Penn have any rules about centers approaching other centers in other countries, for instance, uh, for support on a project? I mean, for me, that is what we're talking about, centers, you know, center twinning and working together. But do you know if Penn's got any, you know? Not that I know of, um, uh, and not that I'm aware of. I mean, the best person to answer that question, I think, would be Romana. But we, we do have centers helping each other and working together. Yeah. Like we have a case of uh, Penn, I think it's Penn Quebec that worked with one of the Latin American centers. Um, so mm -hmm. they, they are twinning projects. And I don't think, I don't know if there's any rule. I've not heard of it. I think that might be where Penn International can help. I think if we can facilitate and do those introductions, I yeah. think that's a future piece of work to identify maybe a, uh, a research project to identify what different levels of fundraising are taking place and it's almost a map of the different centers and where they're at and which centers can best support other centers on different fundraising uh, opportunities um, but Abdullah if I were in, if I was in your position and I knew someone I would go to them thanks and I would like to ask something as well um, no. <laughs> so first of all thanks for the workshop i really like uh, fundraising like really it's something i like i don't know why like naturally but i was wondering now that we are having these digital comms projects and that people are kind of starting to use more social media and stuff like that maybe because we're doing also this campaign in social media we at some point it's something i could help the centers with like uh, based on our experience, because we're going to have also talks about this from a comms perspective, how, in which kind of posts uh, to add this kind of uh, appeal. Maybe from that learning, I could also, when, when I talk to projects about the digital com pro uh, projects and even the centers that don't have digital com projects, doesn't matter, you can reach out to me for digital stuff if you, if you need help. And um, maybe it could be, yeah, I think to start for them experiencing within the framework of this digital comms project, I don't know, like social media, putting the form on their website, maybe um, you, even using crowdfunding platforms, I don't know, like, what do you think? Yeah, we can, I mean, I think that's a fantastic idea, Maria. And yes, please. Um, I mean, we have heard about some of the technical challenges some of the centers have with uh, web access, but I think crowdfunding is definitely the way to go and to develop social media presence. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And it should be, you're right, it should be a part of the general digital development support we do. Excellent. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. So if any center want to incorporate that to their social media work and, and the website, uh, just talk to me and also I'll get in touch with, with Paul. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do can I just ask? Just can I have a show of hands? How many centres have um, an any social media account, any social media presence? Just put your hands up if you have a. Yeah. So to Haiti. So do you give people your followers? Do they have opportunities to send a donation? Do you put out your bank details or you know you? Can, no. Okay, that's something maybe to think about in your strategies for future years. 
I mean, it's a little bit trans transactional, so I'm contradicting myself, but it is a way to identify, um, you know, new audiences and be able to go to them at a later stage to invite them to an event or to engage them more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I've said it all, but thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you, Paul. That was brilliant. And I hope for the second session, maybe with more specific on a, if people, if the um, feedback is for specific areas, maybe going through how to write a template, how to write a proposal, uh, maybe that might be helpful.